Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed communion. We thank you for the means of grace which you have ordained, means of communing like we are right now in your church, with your people, with you, these sweet, sweet means of grace, God, that we're going to talk so much about today. Lord, we thank you that, God, you didn't leave us in our desperation. Lord, you didn't leave us in our state of hopelessness and utter futility, but you did something about it. And, uh, and that's to put it mildly, because, Lord, you sent your only Son down to earth to take our place. Jesus Christ paid the cost that we, we should have paid on the cross that day in order to reconcile us to you. And now, God, it's in that state of reconciliation that we as believers, we get to partake in these ordinary means of grace. We get to pray to you which is such a gift, Lord, a gift that the Old Testament saints would have, would have scoffed even at the notion of. How could somebody go before the holy God without offering sacrifice after sacrifice, without after um, uh, cleaning themselves, purifying themselves over and over again? How could they even do that? And we thank you for this word, this, this wonderful word of God, your Bible God that you have given to us, the, the complete revelation, the full canon of Scripture, another means of grace. And we thank you for these two sacraments that you've given to us also, through which we get a physical representation of a spiritual reality that Jesus Christ truly came in the flesh to save sinners like us, God. And we thank you that through these means of grace, they do just that. They impart to us grace. You dispense your grace upon us through these, through these rites that you have given to us. And we get to partake in them as your covenant people. And so, Lord, I pray that um, we would all walk out of here uh, better informed about your ordinances, your sacraments that you have given to your church. I pray that we would be convicted by the word preached here. I pray that your word would do the work, that by your spirit you would apply these truths to the hearts of your people, God, something that I am utterly unable to do. God, I'm helpless apart from your spirit's work in this place. So Lord, would you be pleased to do just that by your spirit? Would you work on hearts? Would you bring to repentance sinners? Would you convict existing believers, God? And would we be able to celebrate you as we talk about these blessed, beautiful ordinances? And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who gave us those ordinances. Amen. Well, church, I would encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, week after week, we are in a sermon series that is uh, a little different for us. This is a topical sermon series, so we're actually looking at a lot of Scripture uh, this morning and, and every week that we're in this series. Uh, but we're going to start here in Acts 2, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 29, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 29. We are, of course, at um, the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has just been dispensed upon the people, and Peter is in the midst of a powerful sermon when we read these words. Beginning in verse 29, he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would be set that he would set one of his descendants on his throne he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh see corruption this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 
For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, My name is Max Monahan. I'm the lead pastor here at the Shepherd's Church. Uh, So privileged to be. And today is a beautiful day. Amen? Yes, today is a beautiful day. Today we celebrate new life in Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism. Yes, and wow, we should indeed celebrate because this is an awesome day. It has become unmistakable to me at the same time that we come to a topic that is heavy. This is a sacred topic. As I followed along with the well-trodden paths of the reformers, of the apostles, and the post-apostolic fathers, as I recounted the contentious and bloody history of the sacraments, I can come to only one conclusion— The enemy would love to destroy these doctrines. The enemy would love to divide God's true church or deceive God's true church by having it believe these ordinances either do something that God never teaches or he would love to add and elevate new ordinances which God never intended to be ordinances or some other hateful and diabolical trick. Satan would love to do that with these wonderful ordinances. And our history reflects that. Time prevents us from speaking of the numerous battles between Protestants and Roman Catholics over the practice of the Mass and Rome's distortion of God's sacraments. Time prevents us from talking about the disputes amongst the Reformed like Zwingli and Calvin and Luther over communion and what it meant. There is also a bloody history of the Reformers and the Anabaptists over the issue of baptism, and there have been divides over all of the above ever since. Sadly, even frequently, between those who would see each other as brothers, who should see each other as brothers, I should say. Nevertheless, while this is a heavy subject, this is a glorious subject. We see in these two ordinances a physical gift from God to his people. We have, in the words of Augustine, the visible word of God. Think about that for a moment. God has given us a physical representation of his promises, physical signs, symbols, and seals that we can trace back to the beloved son, Jesus. Jesus really did die for the forgiveness of those who would believe upon him for the salvation of their souls. And he really did rise from the grave, vindicating that sacrifice's sufficiency. And in so doing, he secured for his people eternal life through him. And it's that death and resurrection and our subsequent new eternal life in him that we communicate in the physical act of baptism. 
And Jesus really had his body broken, his blood poured out that he might bring into effect the new covenant with new covenant conditions, which he alone met on behalf of his people, the new people of God, the church, who celebrate their table, excuse me, they celebrate their king and his accomplishments at the Lord's table, where they get to partake in the physical bread and wine and eagerly await his return. So while much ink has been spilled over these subjects, while believers have put one another to shame or even death in some instances over these doctrines, while Satan would love to taint, pervert, or otherwise weaponize these ordinances for his purposes, we see that these are precious and we will partake in them. That's our title of the message for this morning. In this house, we partake in the ordinances. We partake in the ordinances. Folks, if you're new here today, I'm so glad you're here. We have a lot of new faces here uh, to celebrate baptism alongside some of our people. And uh, what a joy it is to have you here. I would love to get to know you, hear your story. I pray that the Lord is going to do a work on your heart over the course of this sermon And just to update you a little bit, we're in the middle of a series called House Rules. This is a sermon series that is really going through kind of the fundamentals of the faith. We're talking about the individual level. What do we believe as Christians? What does God call us to as Christians? We're talking about it at the church level, uh, God's church at large. And even more specifically, what do we do here at this church? What do we do here at this church? These are some things that we've gone over. We talked about the glory of God first and foremost, that in this house we will praise the Lord. We talked about how after that, in this house, we will pursue one another. These are uh, two representations of the two great commandments. These are foundational for a biblical church. And then the past three weeks, we got into some external marks of God's true church. If you're looking for a true, solid, biblical church, they need to have these things. They need to have the word faithfully preached and exposited. You need to be fed, people. They need to have prayer. And today we get to talk about yet another mark of a true church, yet another mark that somebody on the outside could look at and say that's a true church of God and they are these ordinances. Just for sake of clarity, when I say ordinances, I am referring to the only two ordinances that the Lord Jesus prescribed for his church, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper, also known as communion. And so our big idea for the day is a simple one. God calls his covenant people to partake in and reflect on the rites of baptism and communion. Put more simply, God wants his church to do these two things. That's what God wants. This wording, as I've said it there, is important, and we'll get to that partake in and reflect on part later, but for now I just want to draw your attention to that covenant piece. This is a word that may seem antiquated. It might seem outdated. Perhaps it conjures in your mind this notion of legalism. But I would say, like many biblical words that have been distorted or abused throughout history, our move away from the common use of this word is only to our detriment. If there is a backbone to the Bible, a structure, if you will, upon which the whole redemptive history and narrative is affixed, that backbone would be God's covenants. This is a word, of course, that speaks of a contract. These covenants take different shapes. There are some that are purely gracious on the part of the sovereign party, and there are others that require that both parties fulfill some sort of obligation. These are explicit. There are explicit covenants, like the Noahic covenant. Remember, God made a covenant with creation that he would never again send floodwaters to wipe everybody out. Or the Mosaic covenant, wherein God promised that if the people obeyed the law, they would be able to stay in the land and be fruitful, and they would be blessed. There are also implicit covenants, like the covenant of redemption, which we'll get into a little bit later, as well as the covenant of works, which we'll also get into a little bit later. But in every case, there's an understanding of the responsibilities of both parties. There are understood ramifications in the form of curses that will occur should one or both parties fail to uphold their end of the bargain. And then they both agree to these terms. So this word for covenant, it speaks to some kind of contract, but this is also a word that describes love. 
What do I mean by that? Well, in the context of a covenant with God, while there are often repercussions for disobedience for the people, there are also blessings promised. And even more than that, God owes us nothing. When you're brokering a deal, it is the one with the most leverage, the most power, essentially the strongest and most sovereign party that really gets to define the terms of the agreement. Treaties are not written and ratified by the loser of the war. It's to the victor go the spoils. But God, he set his love upon his people. The fact that he makes any sort of bargain for our good, we who have betrayed him and rebelled against him, it's absolutely mind-boggling. Even the word that we often see translated as steadfast love, loving kindness, the Hebrew word chesed, this word is used to describe God's loyal love, his covenant love toward his covenant people, those with whom he has entered into a covenant. Now you might be wondering, okay, good history lesson. What does that got to do with baptism and the Lord's Supper? Turns out a lot. Let's look at baptism first. Let's first look at baptism Now, this morning is going to be a little bit different than most Sundays. Rather than a whole bunch of points, we're going to do this kind of catechism style. We're going to ask some questions, and then we're going to answer those questions. And in the end, hopefully, you'll walk out of here with a little mini cheat sheet in case somebody asks you, what is communion all about? What is baptism all about? Starting with this, what is it? What is baptism? And I'll give you the answer right up front. It is covenant initiation covenant initiation. It can be said that baptism is the entrance into the new covenant for God's people, the church. Baptism is you signing your copy of the covenant agreement. The best example of a biblical covenant in our day and age is the covenant of marriage. This is an agreement that a prospective husband and wife enter into, with God, of course, saying that the husband will fulfill certain obligations, and the wife will fulfill certain obligations, and they make that pledge before God and witnesses, which is another key aspect of biblical covenants. And that's why, for the record, we fight for the sanctity of marriage, because this is a covenantal agreement. It's not just a contract like you make with your phone carrier. It's a covenant, a lifelong pledge. And this is what we do when we are baptized. We are committing to a life following Jesus. We pledge before God and witnesses our allegiance to Christ. And along with that commitment, just as in marriage, when you commit, you enter into a new relationship with the other involved parties. So too do you when you enter into, through the waters of baptism, this covenant with God. You are showing that you are a member of his covenant people. The difference, however, between marriage and the covenant of faith is that you become a child of God when the Holy Spirit transforms your heart. It's just that you proclaim that spiritual transformation sometime later. And when you do, you proclaim that, that, that has already happened in a physical way through the waters of baptism. Okay, so that's an overview. Real quick, you know, a uh, uh, 30,000 foot view of what baptism is. It is an external physical representation of an inward, internal transformation, spiritual transformation. And if that didn't tip you off as to our conviction here at the Shepherd's Church, perhaps you're wondering, well, what form of baptism do we practice here in this house? Well, the mode that we practice here has been traditionally known as believer baptism, or more technically speaking, credo baptism. This is in contrast to many of those we would call our brothers in the faith, particularly with those known as Reformed Presbyterians who practice what we would call baby or infant baptism, or perhaps more technically, pedo baptism. Now, a word to pedo baptists um, First and foremost, I just want to say, uh, most of my heroes of the faith are Presbyterians or were Presbyterians. My son is named after the Presbyterian John Knox, the great Scottish reformer. And so I I mean no disrespect when I get into this topic, but we're going to preach on what we preach here. And a word to Credo Baptists, uh, my believer Baptist brothers and sisters, these are also our brothers in the faith, our brothers and sisters in the faith, those that practice baby baptism. And so we don't turn our nose up and say that we've got it figured out and you don't. Somebody's going to be wrong. We know that much. (laughs) But neither side is willing to say it's you. 
but we will make our cases. With that being said, I'm going to give you seven quick reasons why we hold the credo baptism here at the Shepherd's Church. Number one, the first three centuries of church history. Early church history shows no evidence of baptizing infants until the third century when it was refuted by the theologian Tertullian. Witnesses from that, t- that time include the Didache and Justin Martyr. The Didache was a summary, supposedly, of apostolic tradition. It was supposed to be a guidebook for a new believer, and it was written toward the end of the first or the beginning of the second century. It seemed to indicate that the only valid means of baptizing a person was to be done by immersion in a running body of water, which is something that you can't do with an infant. You wouldn't dunk your infant in a, a, a lake. And only in the event that running water isn't available can you pour out water on the head of the baptizee. And that was the only case in which you could avoid immersion. So surely infant baptism, were it being practiced at that time, it would be mentioned here as another reason not to completely submerge the baptizee, if that makes sense. Justin Martyr, he wrote in his first apology, early second century. This was a defense uh, for the Christian faith to the Roman emperor at the time. He referred to baptizees as those who are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live accordingly. There is no provision made here for those who cannot make that choice, that decision. And shortly after, he even compares babies with you know, the, uh, the birth that we all are born with, are born through, which is not our choice, with the baptism, which is our choice. We choose to be baptized. Babies, therefore, who make no choice are the antithesis of the person to be baptized in the eyes of Justin, the antithesis of the reborn individual. We do get from Tertullian, Tertullian on his work, in his work on baptism in the first decade of the third century, a mention that this is heady, guys. I apologize. I'm realizing now I'm giving you a full-blown history lesson. So this is an opportunity to take a breath, I suppose. Okay, back to it. In the first decade of the third century, his work on baptism does have a mention of infant baptism, but it would seem that the practice was reprehensible in his estimation. He says, the Lord does indeed say, forbid them not to come unto me, but he says, let them come then while they are growing up. Let them come while they are learning, while they are learning whither to come. Let them become Christians when they have become able to know Christ. If any understand the weighty import of baptism, they will fear its reception more than its delay. Sound faith is secure of salvation. So Tertullian, he didn't leave much room for this as well, but it did seem that it was popping up in his time. Uh, popularized especially by Hippolytus or Hippolytus, they call him Hippo for short. I don't know if that's true. Um, some more church history during the Reformation. Praise God for the Reformation, by the way. Guys like Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, John Knox, they turned the, wor- the world upside down by reforming the church according to the Bible. But these men were fallible too, just like the rest of us. There were these guys that followed along Ulrich Zwingli called the Swiss Brethren, okay? They, they dove into their word just like Ulrich Zwingli did, and, and these guys have unfortunately been lumped into a broader category uh, called the Anabaptists. I say unfortunately because a lot of the Anabaptists were actually radical, and they took very extreme measures in light of their views. But these Swiss Brethren, along with Zwingli, they realized that the practice of infant baptism, well, well, that's not in here. We can't find it here. And we're trying to hold to this regula- regulatory principle of worship, and yet we don't see it here. But Ulrich Zwingli was aligned with the Zurich City Council. And the city of Zurich was considered to be a Christian city. Thus, in the words of one historian, Zwingli had moved to a decided commitment to infant baptism probably, this is speculation on the part of this historian for sure, but definitely informed, probably because he realized that its rejection undermined the concept of Zurich as a corporately Christian city and hence led to the end of government support for his reforming program. In other words, Zurich being a fully Christian city benefited Zwingli greatly, and it's hard to be a fully Christian city when you're considering only the repentant as members of the community. Well, he had to refute the Swiss brethren now because he's at odds with them, and that's when we're told by another historian, Nick Needham, the Zurich reformer constructed a biblical defense of infant baptism by appealing to the analogy of circumcision. Now, for those of you that know anything about this this debate, this is a cornerstone argument for the paedobaptist position. 
Thus, we can say that much of the Reformed argument for infant baptism was birthed not so much from a place of conviction, such as the rest of the Reformation, so much as a desire to see a threat to progress extinguished. You might call that conjecture, okay? But this is just one line in a series of arguments. And if you think I'm being uncharitable, many of these Anabaptists were exiled or martyred by the Reformation-friendly governments with Zwingli himself influencing his own Zurich City Council to issue the death penalty by drowning, which was then used on some of his old friends from the Swiss Brethren, notably Felix Manns. And the expression was, he who dipped shall be dipped. And that might also serve, just for the record, just as an aside, to temper our Christian nationalistic zeal, by the way. Even when your government is aligned with the Reformation, it can still be problematic. We could also look at the Great Awakening. When Jonathan Edwards inherited the pulpit of his grandfather Solomon Stoddard in the 18th century, as is the case when many young pastors take the helm, they find that their first duty is to set to order what was left in disarray. Solomon Stoddard was a wonderful man by all accounts, but one of the things that he espoused, something that had become a common practice at the time, is something called the Halfway Covenant. And this halfway covenant said that children who were baptized as infants still got to be members of the church, but they were not allowed to take communion or vote, though they could still be subject to church discipline. It was this tangled up mess that Jonathan Edwards had to sort out. And I bring this matter up just to show how messy the picture gets when people are admitted entrance into the covenant community without being truly regenerate members of the household of God. As we saw time after time in our study in 1 John, there are only two sides. Those who are gods and those who are not, the elect and the reprobate, those who shall inherit the kingdom of God and those whose destiny lies in judgment. To baptize our children apart from repentance and faith requires us to create a separate category or at the very least, it muddies the waters. Now that's church history, but what about the Bible? How about the prophet Jeremiah? Jeremiah 31, 27 through 34. He says, behold, the days are coming sometime Not in his time. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. Dropping down to verse 29. In those days they shall no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. In other words, no man will be rewarded or condemned for the efforts of his Father, but rather, in the words of Romans 14, Romans 14, 12, each of us will give an account of himself to God. This flies in the face of the Pado baptist understanding of the covenant, wherein either the parent stands in as the child's representi- representative until, the, until they show fruit, or believe that the baptism somehow plants a seed of salvation in the child that will grow in time. Jeremiah continues, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So the new covenant, according to Jeremiah, it's not like the old covenant, which was a covenant of works, but rather the dis- distinguishing characteristic of members of this new covenant will be that they will all know the Lord. In other words, they will be regenerated. We could look at John the Baptist, which is the closest example uh, in the Bible that we have of the ordinance of baptism. They were performed by the Apostle John. Matthew 3, 5 through 9, it says that they were all going out to the Jordan to be baptized by him. They were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. That's critical. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Instead, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. 
Not only is John saying repent, something that a baby is incapable of doing, also the first words recorded from Jesus' preaching ministry in Matthew 4, but he's also claiming that their parentage is not sufficient for entrance into the kingdom, only repentance. It would seem this is the transition point into the new covenant. John Piper put it this way, John the Baptist inaugurated this change and introduced the new sign of baptism. By calling all Jews to repent and be baptized, John declared powerfully and offensively that physical descent does not make one part of God's family, and that circumcision, which signifies a physical relationship, will not be replaced by baptism, which signifies a spiritual relationship. End quote. We could look also at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is one of the um, areas where we have the most disagreements with Pado baptists We all interpret things differently, or we both interpret things differently. One of the most commonly brought up passages we read from is uh, Acts 2.39. We, we read that at the beginning here. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far, far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. They see in this formula a callback to the Old Testament when God speaks to the Old Covenant people Israel and he tells them that the law is for them and their children and the sojourner. But is this sufficient evidence? Well, in the words of one commentator, this phrase has sometimes been used, has been taken as a justification for infant baptism, but this is to press it unduly. If we are to link it with the context, we note that the prophecy in verse 17 thinks of children who are old enough to prophesy, prophesy. And the previous verse speaks of receiving forgiveness in the Spirit. In neither case are infants obviously involved. The point of this phrase, the stress is on the primacy of God's call and the graciousness of his invitation to all mankind. It can be further stated that while there are mentions of households being baptized in the book of Acts, we could look at each one systematically. We won't do it here, unfortunately, even though it's in my notes. We find that there are no children mentioned at all, and in every single case, there is either an explicit indication of belief on the part of one or all parties, or there is at least a preaching of the gospel to which the rest of Scripture's witness can testify must have been accompanied by belief, by belief if they were to be baptized. Now, I won't get into all the rest of the book of Acts, but I will say what Mark Dever said about it. He said, while the topics of both children and baptism occur in the New Testament, the two never occur together in either explicit teaching or example. He goes on, whether construed as a matter of salvific cause or covenantal promise, any teaching that separates baptism from saving belief misrepresents scripture and potentially confuses the gospel itself. And that's as good of a segue as any to our last instance, and that's the rest of the New Testament. On this point, I'll just speak broadly. The picture of salvation in the New Testament is through faith. Romans 4 talks about the promise to Abraham and his offspring, and that it's not through the law, but through faith. Galatians 3 says that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And then also the order of events is always repent and be baptized. So much so is this the order of events that we can assume where repentance isn't mentioned. It is implied in the fact that the person wants to be baptized at all. Not to mention the decree given to us by our Lord Jesus when he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Who is to be baptized? Who is to be taught all that Jesus commanded? Those who were made into disciples. We don't, we don't baptize people who have not yet been made disciples. No, in this house we practice believer baptism. So that's what it is. Lengthy detour. But what does it mean? Well, question number two is this. What does it mean? And the answer is death to sin and self and rebirth in Christ. We are demonstrating that we have died to sin and self, and we have been born again of God in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not disobey, when God's patience waited in the days of, Mo of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. 
Now that's a lot. Let me break it down for you. This passage begins by talking about Christ's work, wherein he was put to death, but then was made alive in the Spirit. It relates this to the days of Noah, wherein God brought eight people and a whole bunch of animals, not mentioned there, safely through floodwaters. And then it talks about your baptism and how that saves you, not because it cleanses you from sin, not, not in that it cleans you like a removal of dirt, but in so much as it represents your cry to God in the name of Jesus who has all authority. What does baptism mean? It means that Christ died for our sins and rose again. And now we can do that too. We can put to death our old selves. We cast off our sin. We repent and we put our faith in Jesus Christ, walking in the newness of life that his righteousness and resurrection afford us. I love that Peter brings in this image of uh, the account of the flood here too, because water has always signified life and death in the Hebrew culture. Think about it. You've got the rivers that flow out of the Garden of Eden that bring life. You've got the flood which brought to death all creation, but saved through those same waters was the blameless Noah and his progeny. Remember Moses? Moses? Moses. (laughs) Moses. His life was saved by sending him down the Nile in a basket. He saved in the Nile, but what was Pharaoh using the Nile for? Putting to death the Israelite baby boys. God then led Moses and the Israelites from death in Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea, the same waters that put to death Pharaoh and his forces. And then Joshua, Moses' predecessor, he led them through the waters of the Jordan, away from the death that their parents experienced in the wilderness, into the life of the promised land. And that's only six books into the Bible. So this is how God speaks. He speaks in terms of life through the chaos, the death that water brings. This is what God does. He's bringing about, he brings about a new creation when he takes his people through water, and that's what we enact in the waters of baptism. Romans 6, 1 through 11 says this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died in sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin." Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So when we take part in baptism, we consider ourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. We declare that we have been set free from sin. We have been baptized into Christ's death, buried with him by baptism into death. That's what baptism means to us here at this church and in every church that, is, that has the Bible as their authority. When we are baptized, we mark the beginning of our covenant relationship with God through repentance and faith corresponding with the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And I should say briefly before I move on, that's what baptism does mean, but can I just say what it doesn't mean? It is for those who are saved. It does not do the saving. We do not believe in baptismal regeneration. That's why we ask questions of our baptism candidates. We want to see discernible signs of existing salvation. And while I say that, I think there is a trend, particularly within our more theological church circles, where we want a person to basically become a seminary professor before they get baptized. And I understand the caution, especially if you are a parent with children. Let's wait to see for sure if this is true fruit, if this is truly repentance. We don't want to baptize unbelievers either, and in so doing, muddy up our visible church unnecessarily. However, I would push back against undue delays. I would say let's not be negligent, but let's also not heap on brand new Christians an unnecessary burden right after they give their life to Christ. So baptism doesn't save, but it should be practiced. How? How should it be practiced? What do we do with it is our third question for baptism. Do it and remember it. 
Do it and remember it. Really simple. When I say do it, I say that when we get baptized, we proclaim to God and the watching world our commitment to follow our King Jesus all of our days. Again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We need to baptize people and we need to be baptized people. This is a bona fide mark of a Christian. They have declared to the church and to others, this is my life now. I think I told you guys sometime uh, in some other sermon what my grandma says of me. Uh, Her speech is a little broken. She jumbles up her words, but she always says this when she talks about me. Oh yeah, he used to do that. Now he does this. (laughs) And what she means is insert any descriptor of my old life, but now I love the Lord. So the question here is for you, uh, if you are a believer, have you been baptized? And if not, why? This is an act of obedience for every Christian, for the one who has repented of their sins and put their faith in Jesus, who, by the way, modeled this baptism. He, He himself was baptized, and he said it was in order to fulfill all righteousness. He was doing what we are called to do. Now, we need to baptize people, and we need to do so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's also important. If somebody has been baptized in some other name or in some other version of God that is not the triune God, that is not a baptism that we would consider valid. And Scripture is our guide there. We must be baptized, and we must be baptized in the right name. But we also need to remember our baptism, you guys. Because your baptism is so closely linked to salvation, you can call to mind your baptism for assurance. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Period. It's as simple as that. That means, believer, when those doubts creep in, when the lies of the enemy rise up in your mind, you can remember your baptism and say, No, that's my identity. I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have been raised to newness of life in Jesus Christ. I have been, in the words of Galatians 2.20, crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Those lies are just that. They're lies. That's who I am. That person that got in those waters. So believer, call to mind your baptism. Reflect on that step that you took, that act of faith and obedience, and reflect on what that symbolized, that you were done with that old life and wanted to do it Christ's way. So that's baptism, but what about the Lord's table? What about communion? Well, we're going to answer three questions here as well. Our first question is this, what is it? Same question. It's covenant renewal. Before diving right into what it actually is, what that means, let's talk about what it could be. It could mean that the bread and the drink, the the fruit of the vine, we use juice, it's not actual wine, okay, that's why I say fruit of the vine, it literally becomes the body and the blood of Jesus. This is a view called transubstantiation. It's practiced by Roman Catholics. Basically, the substance of the elements transforms into Christ's body and blood. This is done by the blessing of the priest. He's the only one that can do it. And it is considered as if Christ himself is being sacrificed for his people over and over again, each and every mass, though to a lesser degree than the extent of the cross. Of course, because it's literally Christ's blood and and body, according to them. Congregants were not even allowed to drink this wine because of that fact, because what would happen if they spilled some of Christ's blood? Now, we would vehemently reject this view. In fact, it's this view that the early church fathers had to defend against in the early church, long before it became a reality in the Roman Catholic Church. That's what people thought of Christians. They thought that we were cannibals. They heard rumors, and they thought we were actually eating a person and drinking his blood. So some of the early apologists, including Justin Martyr, who we talked about in our first point, he had to explain that, it, no, 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 it's just bread and wine. We're not eating a person. Christians are good people. Martin Luther, he popularized a different view, and that view said that Christ was physically present in the elements, but in a, in a different way. 
This was a view called consubstantiation. He believed that it was really Christ, but that the substance remained bona fide bread and wine. He said in his small catechism, what is the sacrament of the altar? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus under the bread and the wine for us Christians to eat and to drink, instituted by Christ himself. This, it would seem, is a halfway point between the Roman Catholic view and Luther's contemporaries. Calvin, he held to a spiritual presence view. He contended sharply with Luther. The difference, according to one historian, was that Luther rejected only what the scriptures would not prove, but Calvin refused everything of the past that could not be proved by scriptures. Another view was from Ulrich Zwingli, who held to the memorial view, which means that you, you reflect on Christ's sacrifice. It's a callback to what he did on the cross. But what is communion for us? Well, I would submit to you a combination of two views. I would say that it is indeed memorial, as well as a spiritual communion with our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who he poured out on us. The memorial view is indeed biblical. As Jesus said in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19, after breaking bread and giving it to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Paul, likewise, he called, called to mind the fact that we are proclaiming the Lord's death, a past event, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. The spiritual presence view is also biblical as we are told that Christ is indeed with his disciples until the end of the age. I propose that these two concepts should be married and I would add in a third, which is to say a future aspect. For Christ, uh, he told his disciples on the night that he was betrayed just after instituting the Lord's Supper for them, he said, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There's a future element there. And then Paul brings that sentiment to bear in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26, when he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we should be looking ahead too. This is what communion looks like for us. And if you hadn't guessed it already, how does this relate to the covenant we have with our Lord? Well, communion for us is a covenant renewal. This is something God did with the Israelites all throughout the Old Testament. And in the context of a wedding analogy, it's like you renewing your vows. When we come to the table, we say afresh, yeah, we are God's people. And it gives us opportunity to examine ourselves. We come to the table remembering his glorious deeds. We come to the table knowing he is with us currently. And we come to the table with great expectation, anticipating the day when he comes again and judges the living and the dead and ushers in, excuse me, a wonderful eternity with him in eternal communion. So that's what communion is. What does it mean? It means that Jesus died to save sinners. Listen, at the end of the day, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, this beautiful breaking of bread, communion, this means one thing. Jesus died to save sinners. There is a God who reigns on high above, who has eternally existed in three persons father son and holy spirit this god though he owes his own existence to no one though he has no need of anyone though he is perfect and complete in and of himself this god who can only be described as holy which is a word that we have no context for it means that he is blameless perfect majestic set apart in a category all of his own this god out of the abundance of love that existed within his three persons he made the heavens and the earth and every living thing including you and me he set his love upon man in a unique way in the creation account he created him differently he actually made man to be like him it says after his likeness and he made them male and female he gave them duties and responsibilities but they were not done with toil they weren't it wasn't hard labor it wasn't painstaking these were incredible initiatives and they included having dominion over the rest of God's creation on earth as well as true communion with God presumably forever that was the covenant of works all man had to do was continue in this and not breach the covenant but that's exactly what he did, and that's exactly what we do too. See Hosea 6, 7. 
Even though he had been warned that the just, pu- just punishment for such treachery was death, he still sinned against God. And, and though that same law is written on our hearts, that same warning, and though the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, we still sin against God each and every day. And apart from a work of God, that communion between God and man that was so beautiful in the beginning, it's just a pipe dream. There's no way for us to bring it about on our own. This is a truly deplorable and tragic state. But God, right? But God did not see fit to leave it that way. You see, he had made another covenant long before the covenant that he made with Adam. He had made a covenant of redemption And he made it with himself within the members of the Godhead. And so while mankind's situation looked like it was going from from bad to worse, God was at work. He gave them provisionary sacrifices and rituals to perform in order to regain a semblance of fellowship with their God. We talked about that last week. It turns out God had made a way to draw his people near. And that was through the shedding of blood, as it turns out, as peculiar as that may sound. The Israelites, God's Old Testament people, they were able to shed the blood of spotless animals in order to regain proximity to God in a temporary sense. These animals would essentially be their stand-in, their substitute. They would pay the punishment for their sin. But it's just that they would have to do that over and over and over again because of the immensity of the debt that man owed. And it's in that place that the covenant of redemption really comes into play. Because God's inner Trinitarian agreement said that the Father would send his Son down to earth, his only Son down to earth, to have his own blood shed, his own body broken, so that all those who repent of their sins and put their faith in him might be set free. That they would see the shackles of their sin destroyed or taken as far away from them as the east is from the west. Jesus Christ would be their substitute. He would live a perfect life, never once breaching that covenant, completely honoring it. Fulfilling the terms for his people, he would die an absolutely brutal death in their place on the cross. And he would rise again on the third day, showing that the sacrifice was pleasing and acceptable. That the body broken, the blood spilled, had indeed brought into being that sweet new covenant, the covenant of grace, true reconciliation with God. And we all, as God's people, get to be a part of it by repentance and faith in him. That's what communion means. That's what communion is to us. And if you're here today, And you're like, I have no clue what you're talking about. If you're here today and you have not repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, the one who stood in our place to pay our debt for our sin, then you stand under judgment. There is a day appointed for every man to go to the judgment. And the verdict will be a guilty one. And you will be cast into the lake of fire. And as I always say, I don't say that to scare you. That's not my intention. But to let you know what this book says, And that there's an option for you. There's a savior reserved for you. If you would repent of your sins, which is to turn away from your sins and put your faith in him, you will be saved. Reconciled to God, that relationship repaired, and you will inherit eternal life with him. This is what communion is all about. It's about Christ. His body broken, his blood poured out for you. But what do we do with it? Well, I would say, examine yourself, be united, and look to Christ. If you like alliterations, you can call this inward, outward, upward. Inward, examine yourself. First off, before taking the bread and the cup, always, always, always examine yourself. Those are Paul's exact words to the Corinthians. He says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Pretty scary stuff. He goes on to say, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Yeesh. But if we judged ourselves truly, he says, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. We often talk about how you shouldn't just take the cup in an unworthy manner when we have communion here. And many of you know what I mean by that, but from the personal side of things, you should be a believer. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, don't take the bread and the cup. 
Beyond the fact that it wouldn't mean to you what it means to us, it's making a mockery of what it does mean. And what it means is that there is a maker of the heavens and the earth and a sustainer of all life, and we're looking at the work that he did for his people. It is he who will judge those who don't take this matter seriously. So if you're a believer, I'm so glad you're here. We're not taking communion today, so you don't have to examine yourself in that respect. But I would say this is a great opportunity to examine yourself in a holistic sense. Have you considered deeply the offense of your sin? Do you recognize the beauty of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross on behalf of sinners such as yourself? You must repent, friend. Turn away from your sin. But this, is a self-exam- this self-examination goes further, and, and we can stay in 1 Corinthians 11 for it, because this examination should have in mind your relationship with the body of Christ. This is that outward piece. And essentially, it's, it's this, be united. At the heart of that passage in 1 Corinthians is the word in verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, the body of Christ, eats and drinks judgment on himself. We don't commune with just God at communion. We commune with one another. We who are in Christ are all one in Christ. So if we have grievances with our brothers and sisters, it is more like a lethal infection in the body than it is something harmless and benign. That's why Paul says, dropping down to verse 17 now, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. I hear that there are divisions among you. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. What? Paul is not happy with the disunity of the body. It is supposed to be a shared meal with fellow believers, and we are supposed to be united. That's why we always say if you're not on good terms with a believer in the congregation, or if you're not on good terms with your local church, in good standing with your local church, don't take the bread and the cup. Communion is that way. If you're not right with somebody, examine yourself, hold off communion for that day, then go and be reconciled to your brother. There's an amount of haste in that language as well. Now, the same can be said for cases of church discipline. If you're under church discipline, you should not be taking communion, not just for your own sake, but for the sake of the body. Paul gives a stark warning in 1 Corinthians 5 when he says, purge the wicked person from among you. Don't even eat with such a one. Straighten that out. Mourn over your sin, repent of your sin, and come back to the table the next time around. You'll be happily restored and welcome to the table, I should add. But not only that, there's also this upward notion, and that's to look to Jesus. Again, I submit to you a threefold approach to communion. Believer, after examining yourself and your relationship with the church, look unto your Lord and Savior. Recall the past and his sacrifice that he became for you on the cross. Call to mind the profound truth that he is with you by his spirit, guiding and governing you, knowing there is a very real and intimate communion available to you in the here and now, and look ahead to the future in eternity with your good and gracious God, wherein you will celebrate the marriage supper of the lamb the true fulfillment of communion what could be better than that now church these are the sacraments what awesome and wonderful gifts these are i'll leave you with the words of herman bovink he held out these two precious ordinances in particular against the sacrilege of the many quote-unquote sacraments of the roman catholic church and he said this for protestant christians It is enough to have the word and the two sacraments instituted by Christ. In them, if they accept them in faith, they possess the whole Christ, the full treasure of his merits, perfect righteousness and holiness, and unbreakable fellowship with God. They are liberated from all guilt, released from all punishment. Of this, they are assured in baptism, and they are continually strengthened and confirmed in that faith by the Lord's Supper. By the word, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, they receive all the grace they need in life and in death for time and eternity. Their only comfort is that they belong to Christ. They live in that comfort and die in that comfort. Christ for them has accomplished everything. Now with that being said, folks, I'm going to pray. And then I would invite you to make your way out these doors where we will um, partake in the ordinance of baptism 
And I'll just say, I, was, I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but if there's anybody else here and the Lord has been impressing this upon them that, that they need to be baptized, you have yet to be baptized, um, I would love to have that conversation with you and we'll make it happen. Uh, we'll make sure that you, uh, you have indeed searched your heart and that um, you are committing to follow Jesus for all your days. But with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful gift, or these wonderful gifts, rather, of the sacraments, the ordinances, the Lord's table and baptism. Lord, we want to see more of you, and we recognize that these physical gifts are just that. They they show you and your character, the work that you performed on behalf of lawless sinners like ourselves. We thank you that you give us something to hold on to in the rite of baptism, something to call back to, to say, no, 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 that's the person that I am. I don't need to believe the lies of the enemy or the doubts of my own flesh. And we thank you for the Lord's Supper, Lord, wherein we remember the past sacrifice of our king on our behalf. What kind of king dies for his constituents? What kind of king becomes a servant? on their behalf in order to exemplify service for them. And we think about the present and how he is, he is with us now. When we partake in communion, especially there's, a, there's a, a, a means of grace to it wherein you actually dispense grace to us by your spirit. We recognize that apart from your spirit, these elements, those elements mean nothing. Just like the waters of baptism mean nothing outside of your spirit's work and the word proclaimed. And on that note, Lord, we proclaim these things until we see our Lord again, looking uh, at that horizon, anxiously awaiting for your return, return, Lord Jesus. It's those things that we remember and celebrate. It's all about Jesus. I pray that that would be the thing that everyone leaves out of here with today. God, give us strength as we proceed to the waters of baptism. We pray it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.